Last recognized by name by the Joint Chair. A reminder that all comments should be addressed through the Joint Chair, and when speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. Interpretation in this video conference will work like in an in-person committee meeting. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor, English, or French. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome our witnesses and thank you for your patience as we went a little bit over on the first hour. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce them. So as an individual, we have Ramona Coelho, physician, Disability Without Poverty's representative, Michelle Hewitt, co-chair of the board of directors, and Bill Adair, executive director of Spinal Cord Injury Canada. So thank you for joining us, and we will begin with opening remarks by Dr. Coelho, followed by Ms. Hewitt and um, Dr. Adair. So Dr. Coelho, you will have five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My family medical practice cares for marginalized patients, including those living in poverty, refugees, men out of prison or facing charges, the LGBTQ plus community, indigenous persons, and those struggling with mental health, addictions, chronic pain, and disabilities. I myself have experienced childhood racism, bullying, and sexual abuse. So I understand that the choice to die can easily be influenced by injustices that life has dealt us. At prior committees, I had raised concerns that inequalities and circumstances such as poverty, trauma, lack of timely access to medical lead to MAID being raised as a treatment option to such a victim of discrimination. I warned that many injuries and illnesses are accompanied by transient suicidality that ends with adaptation and support, but on average takes two years. But then the overwhelming majority of persons after those two years rate their quality of life as the same as aged matched healthy individuals. Offering MAID in a period of known increased suicidality would lead to premature deaths of those who would have recovered. Now Bill C-7 is legal. A man had a small stroke affecting his balance and swallowing. The patient was depressed and isolated due to COVID-19 outbreak on his ward. The stroke neurologist anticipated the man would be able to eat normally and regain most of his balance. He declined all therapy and psychiatry diagnosed him with an adjustment disorder, but they felt he would improve. However, he requested MAID. Neither of his MAID assessors had any experience in stroke rehabilitation and recovery. In this acute phase, while struggling with his mood and isolation, with no therapy to gauge his final level of function, he received MAID. He had no ter terminal illness, but due to the fact that he was adapting to a slightly thickened diet and so was temporarily slightly undernourished, they considered him track one eligible and he received made the following week. No safeguards were technically broken and yet he died when acutely down, isolated and had not experienced living with maximal recovery from his stroke. Mr. E.N. was a 71-year-old widower admitted to hospitals for falls. During his admission, he contracted C. difficile, an infectious diarrheal illness. He was openly humiliated by staff for the smell of his room. He developed new shortness of breath that was not comprehensively assessed. Without patient quest, request, a hospital team member raised and recommended made to him. The team said he had COPD and it held a terminal prognosis. The MAID procedure was booked by the hospital team before he even had a second assessment, and within 48 hours of his first assessment, he was dead. Post-mortem tests confirmed no significant COPD, and his family doctor also said he didn't have end-stage COPD, but no one had contacted her for collateral history. MAID was raised to this patient. There is no safeguard in Bill C-7 that forbids raising MAID, and the related amendment was voted down by the Senate. CAMAP has a document called Bringing Up MAID, and Susan McDonald had mentioned in this committee that MAID should be raised as part of the informed consent process. 
was Ray's maid because his admission was longer than expected because he was a victim of ageism? Did he choose maid because his acute care team made him feel horrible? His family believes so. The In Plain Sight BC report and the tragic story of Joyce Echequan demand that we take these considerations seriously. And lastly, after a CTV uh, W5 story showed a gentleman's maid provision, um, a patient, the immediate Monday, let me know that the story was super appealing and maid would be good for her. My patient is in her mid, early midlife, has a recent spinal cord injury, she hasn't had time to adjust, receive peer support or proper symptom control, nor reach maximal recovery, but she does now qualify for track two made within 90 days. The legislation is built in a way that allows for her death before she's had a chance to experience maximal recovery. This case also shows that the government must consider current suicide research that shows that messaging promoting suicide may lead to more people choosing that. The MAID regime appears to be allowing a right to die with government assistance for certain groups. Inadequate safeguards suggest that this has been packaged and thinly veiled as a medical procedure. If this is not the case, then I ask your government to reconsider its MAID regime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coelho. Uh, next, we will have Ms. Hewitt. You have five minutes, Ms. Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am a disabled woman with multiple sclerosis and I live in Kelowna, BC. At times, my disease has been aggressive and it's fairly advanced. I use a power wheelchair and I have severe fatigue and I have pain, which is sometimes severe. However, I have a great quality of life. Today, I represent disability without poverty. Roughly two in 10 people in living in Canada are disabled. But looking at just those who live in poverty, four in 10 of them are disabled. Disabled people are overrepresented. There are twice as many disabled people living in poverty than statistics alone would account for. Often they live in abject poverty as disability assistance payments are usually as low as half or two thirds of the poverty line. We know that disabled people have been granted MAID because the intolerable suffering they face is caused by poverty. And there are conditions that they would consider access acceptable to relieve that suffering. These are just two examples of people from BC. Sean had ALS and wanted to live at home. He managed to do so for a number of years when the constant stress of finding the right care on his own became too much. His health authority offered him to place him in long term care four hours away from his 10 year old son. Instead, Sean chose maid. He described the funding decisions and institutional offerings advanced by the health authority as a death sentence. Madeline has post viral syndrome and has been living with it for 30 years. There are no Health Canada approved treatments, but she found a combination of treatments that works for her and they all require her to pay out of pocket. However, she has exhausted all options financially and is currently getting by month to month on GoFundMe payments. When the money runs out, Madeline says she'll have no option but to use MAID, which she has already qualified for. She says she has no wish to die, but she'll be facing an unbearable wall of pain that has no quality of life. No one in Canada should ever die because they live in poverty. And yet for disabled people, we hasten that, that death. We provide a state sanctioned procedure for those disabled people to die. For Sean and Madeline, we have remedies to their suffering that would have been acceptable to them. Sean and Madeline have been vocal in the media about their needs and the remedies to their suffering. However, we heard nothing in response to this from the government. Either the government believes that disability accommodations set out in law do not need to be upheld or it does not take its role to oversee the maid safeguard seriously because Sean and Madeline's suffering came from a, a social condition, 
not their medical condition. I cannot believe that that was ever the intention of MAID, that we sanction the deaths of disabled people because they live in poverty. And yet we see it happening. I ask that you recognize that the safeguards are failing and I ask that you support disabled lives, support the Canada Benef Disability Benefit Bill and ensure that it lifts all disabled people out of poverty. Implement wide reform to our care systems that give disabled people the care they want. Until these conditions are met, made eligibility must be restricted to those who are approaching the end of their life where their suffering is intolerable from their medical condition, not from the societal conditions they are forced to live under. I finish with Madeline's words. I'm trying really hard not to freak out, but that I'm facing death for something that can be managed is bloody ridiculous and it makes me so angry. I die when I run out of money. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hewitt. Um, and lastly, we'll have Mr. Adair. You have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Bill Adair. I work for Spinal Cord Injury Canada, founded in 1945 by World War II veterans. Veterans who came back home to a country that expected very little from them. Veterans who dismissed the idea that they would be shut away in convalescent homes. Our founders fought in battles overseas and then back home to provide the proof that their lives are worth living. In fact, 13 of our founders received the Order of Canada because of what they did after the war. But apparently 72 years later, people with spinal cord injuries still need to fight to prove that their lives are worth living. It's tiring fighting for existence but here we are. I have worked with our SCI Federation for 33 of those 72 years. Our organizations across the country support people as they adjust, adapt, and thrive while living with a spinal cord injury. I've fielded requests for support for half of my life. My experience as the past Chief Executive Officer of Spinal Cord Injury Ontario and now the Executive Director of Spinal Cord Injury Canada provide me with a distinct expertise to talk about MAID and its potential impact on people with spinal cord injuries. I'm here to speak with you about two issues, the 90 day wait period and the lack of real choice for persons when they are offered MAID. The 90 day wait period is arbitrary. There are very good reasons, especially related to people with spinal cord injuries, why this wait period should be longer. A recent study found that 50% of respondents with a spinal cord injury had suicidal ideation in the first two years post-injury. Another study found that after the first year post-injury, more than 70% of people rated their life equal to or better than pre-life injury. I know from my work, it can take anywhere from several months to up to seven years or more for a person to mourn their loss and accept their new life. Rehabilitation, court battles, finding accessible housing, and possible work retraining can take years. Sustaining a spinal cord injury is a huge life change. While lying in bed in acute care or in rehab, a person does not possibly have all the information needed to make a life or death decision. And as you know, it takes time to think about all the options, listen to people's views, understand what resources are available and what is not. 90 day wait is not a safeguard for the 4,000 or more people with a new spinal cord injury in Canada each year. Imagine the loss to our society if we allow our fellow citizens to make an impulsive, uninformed decision during the early stages of rebuilding a life that is worth living. Which one of these people could have been our next Order of Canada recipient? My second concern is that people do not have a real choice when they request MAID. When a person discusses MAID with a doctor, they should also be offered other choices such as home services, long-term care, basic living funds, suicide prevention, psychiatric services, safe, accessible, affordable housing. But these services are not offered 
or they're offered actually, but not available because of a wait list or they're too expensive or they're too far away. Then the person isn't really being offered a choice, are they? The person is in fact being denied a choice. It's made or nothing. Many people with a disability suffer because of a lack of available services and being left to live in crushing poverty, not because of their disability. In turn, the lack of available services and a life in poverty kills hope and drives people to choose made to end their misery. This is not the Canada that any of us want. Here's my list of proposed solutions. Extend the wait period if a person is not at the end of life. Implement the Canadian Disability Benefit now. Fund the trained professionals from organizations to go into healthcare centers to provide peer support when someone requests MAID. Build accessible, affordable housing. As parliamentarians, you have a responsibility to change this horrible situation and to prevent it. Please give my recommendations a sober second thought. And thank you for listening and inviting me here. Thank you, Mr. Adair, and thank you to all of our witnesses. So we'll go into our first round of questions, and we'll begin with Mr. Cooper for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Dr. Coelho, can you elaborate a little more on the case of the first patient you cited who suffered from a stroke and was granted medical assistance in dying under the Bill C-14 regime, despite not having a terminal diagnosis as required by law under Bill C-14. So actually, uh, Mr. Cooper, just to clarify, it was more recent than that, but should have fallen under track two uh, under the Bill C-7 regime. Um, this patient did not have any terminal comorbidities and was not dying from his stroke, as is normal custom when someone has a stroke and has difficulty swallowing. Uh, we progress diet sw slowly to avoid aspiration, so like pneumonia and things like this. And he did not choke or aspirate before he died. The dietitian or ordered a normal progression of meals. So he was eating 1,300 calories a day, which is probably what I eat. And he ate his whole tray, every tray, easily. But even if it wasn't, and it was temporary. Um, however, um, I guess this was beyond the scope of the maid assessor's expertise because he wasn't starving, but they decided that he wouldn't be able to survive on a diet as such and therefore qualified him for track one so that he could die with no reflection period. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Coelho. Can you uh, elaborate on the patient who you were recently in contact with who watched the W5 program and, uh, and now is found, as you said, uh, found made appealing. So this is my own patient who I love very much and I did ask her permission to tell her story today and she actually said, as did every single contact in every story I've shared, I've also emailed the chairs with other stories that I couldn't fit here they all are willing to talk to this committee. They want to share their stories about what happened. But she wants to tell you that she is very worried about the poverty she will be thrown into if she can't go back to work and that she'd rather die than live in poverty. And I'm happy to be connected with the clerk, whoever I need to, to give you all of these stories. They're all recent stories, including the ones I already said, uh, sent to Madam and Mr. Chair. Madam Chair. Two and a half minutes. Okay, Dr. Coelho, can you elaborate on the second patient who chose MAID on the basis of an incorrect diagnosis? And uh, splitting your time, uh, Mr. Adair, can you talk a little bit about some of the phone calls your organization has been receiving uh, in regard to MAID from persons who suffer from spinal cord injuries? Okay, I will try to be very, very quick. Um, I have actually reviewed this medical chart and met with the family myself. The family relates that there was severe humiliation that he endured, the, the staff would leave. All right, Dr. Kuala, your sound is sound. affected at this time, so. And he, oh, sorry. Is something wrong? Yes. 
Yes, would you, would you begin again? Your sound cut out. I think we're having some technical difficulties. So after that, we'll get Mr. Adair to respond as well. Go ahead, Dr. Coelho. I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. So basically, he was being humiliated by... Uh, so basically, I did talk to the family. I reviewed the medical chart myself. He was being humiliated by staff. They would leave the, the windows open, complain when they had to change him. He couldn't get in touch with his family that often. He would go hungry when they cleared his food trays. And in this context, he developed shortness of breath that wasn't comprehensively accessed. And he was become so confused that his oxygen, when it slipped off his face, they had to cancel his second assessment. And the second assessor told the family that she would have to go off the first assessment. And so um, he received made in a very sloppy fashion without proper diagnosis. As I said, the family doctor was never consulted and the diagnosis was not confirmed in hospital or through collateral history taking. Ms. Mr. Adair? Yes, there's um, multiple calls that come into our organization, to our, uh, our organizations across the country. I'm happy to speak about two of them. I had a phone call um, uh, several weeks ago from a colleague who was representing a woman who was 17, year old, 17 years old, who was in intensive care, who had uh, a high level spinal cord injury. Um, and um, and she was wanting to access MAID. So uh, since then, our organization has been able to connect with the family, help them see that there is life after this initial insult uh, of paralysis, and she has turned away from that. So we're grateful for that, but the fact that there's a 17-year-old woman who has enormous potential to contribute to our country, um, even considering MAID, is um, a very problematic. The other uh, is a woman who's in her mid-30s and contacted me and uh, has multiple disabilities and um, has been looking for uh, housing that would support her independence and her ability to return to work after the onset uh, of, a, of a second disability after having a spinal cord injury. Um, and after 10 years, um, or her words, uh, to paraphrase, I'm ready to throw in the towel. I cannot, I cannot take this anymore. I want to lift myself out of poverty. I want to get a job, but I can't find a place to live that will support my independence. Thank you, Mr. Adair. Next, uh, we have a Mr. Maloney. You, you have the floor for five minutes. Thanks, uh, <clears throat> Madam Co-Chair. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses for very... Uh, compelling and uh, helpful testimony, um, enlightening too, I might add. Um, Dr. Coelho, uh, I agree with what you just said. Nobody should ever have to, their circumstances that you've described are appalling. I forget the language you used, but I agree with you. Um, it sounds to me like based on the facts as you presented them anyway, that that particular situation <clears throat> Uh, may have been a result of poor quality of care than the than the laws that were in place, but that's just my interpretation. So my question really is, I do agree with you. Nobody, nobody's financial circumstances, nobody, you know, because they're impoverished or uh, mental health issues or disability status should ever be uh, lead somebody to a situation were made as the option because of that. So my question is, are there safeguards that can be put in place in your opinion that can protect against that? Because I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's an expert panel recently released their findings last week and they they addressed some of these issues. And I was looking for the rec specific recommendation while you were talking, I couldn't find it, but in there somewhere is a recommendation that there be a comprehensive process as part of the assessment to make sure that those aren't circumstances that are giving rise to the request. Is that possible in your opinion? Uh, th thank you. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the question. Um, so just at first to touch on what you were asking about that case with negligence and possible discrimination and a longer uh, admission that they had wanted or anticipated. I do think it raises a real problematic um, like issue. Like Abby Hoffman came to this committee and said, there are no cases of non, hardly any cases of non-compliance. 
it means that Health Canada is not able to capture the data correctly for safety and monitoring, and that really concerns me. The second thing about the expert panel, I did actually review the expert panel, which is actually for made for mental illness as a sole condition. Mm -hmm. And the expert panel is very interesting because, first of all, they never answered the question of can this be done for mental illness, considering that we have a lot of evidence that we have no prognosticators to know for sure if someone is irremediable. So actually meeting the eligibility criteria for made if this is really a medical procedure. And secondly, they offer 19 cautions. So there are 19 things that they consider are very okay, dangerous. Okay, let's let's okay, let me let me focus on do you oh. think that there could be safeguards put in place to protect against the 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 concerns you've raised? That's my so real question. So if you heard me in Bill C7, I had actually proposed several safeguards including never raising it to a patient as they do in the Australia legislation. Um uh, um that people should be able to in their professional integrity decline um, things for scientific data, for example, like patients with disabilities where we know the, the outcome takes years. There was um, an MP Green who imp imp tried to put forward an amendment about making sure that social psychosocial issues were not the reason people were getting made, and these were all voted down. I feel that the made regime is really, really okay. Have you, have you put have you put these suggestions in writing and submitted them to the committee? I, uh, I have, uh, I actually uh, this, did this, send, this, this, so actually I did, I did send a brief it, on May 6th and it is still not up in the written okay, all right, testimony. So these, and is everything you've just said contained in there, all these suggestions you're talking I, about? I can resend you my testimony from Bill C7 if it's helpful, sir, it, it, uh, okay. Madam Chair. If you want to do that, that would be, that would be useful. Okay, so my question is then for all, everybody, and I'm running out of time and I apologize. Um, I recently attended a uh, presentation at a palliative care facility. And it was interesting to me because they said at the beginning when MAID first became the law in Canada, 12 out of 12 doctors at the facility were opposed to it. Six months later, six were accepting it. And now all 12 are accepting it because that's what the patient wanted. So my question to all three of you, has there been any change in the uh, thinking in the disability community over the last uh, number of years? I'll start with you, Mr. Adair. There's only, there's less than a minute, so perhaps two of the witnesses could answer this. Mr. Maloney? So Mr. Adair yeah. first. Oh, you're, you're you unmute, are sir. muted, Mr. Yeah. Adair. Thank you for your question. Uh, there, there, um, I don't, I don't know that there's been any growth in that area that, that I'm aware of. You'd have to uh, ask others who have more information and expertise. Okay, Ms. Hewitt, what about you? I would, um, thank you for the question. I would also say that I don't have data to support it, but certainly anecdotally, people within the disability community um, are raising, talking about made more often and seeing it as a response to societal conditions more than medical conditions. They feel that they're suffering and there is a solution to it, they're not getting that solution, so therefore made. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next we'll have Monsieur Terriot for cinq minutes. Merci, madame. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. I'd like to thank the witnesses for their testimony, which will, of course, shed light on our deliberations. I'll begin with Mr. Adair. First, I'd like to thank you. Your association is important. It's striking that a young person, about 20 years old, could suffer a spinal cord injury and life changes dramatically. And it's clear that there's a social disability and an individual impact and no matter what it is there should be as few social obstacles as possible and it's a daily battle and you work to make it less and less of an obstacle but it's a shock I imagine it's a shock and I was saying 
I was thinking you'd like to have stronger safeguards. I understand that. The safeguard that would mean not beginning the discussion with a patient for a health care professional. Would that be at the beginning after the shock? Would that be a good safeguard? That is to say, for your patients. The the uh, best safeguard is to uh, work with the family and with the person who has the new injury, connect them with families and individuals who have gone through this initial phase of a terrifying shock in many ways and have gotten through that and have uh, rebuilt amazing lives and many lives that are, as I said before, stronger and and more satisfying than they were before the injury. Um, certainly uh, uh, not mentioning the option of MAID uh, for people with new injuries is uh, would be preferable. And um, uh, just not having it available and people until people have had an opportunity to test life and to find out the kind of uh, dreams that they can build and that they will be able to pursue uh, in their new life. But do you not believe, Mr. Adair, that a good medical practice, well, after a sh traumatic shock like this, that it would be a good practice not to propose this option, that that would be good medical practice? And with the experience you have, because of course I agree with you, there needs to be support for this person so that this person can see what their life could be like, their contribution. I understand all of that. And that would be over time, two years, three years, five years, seven years. But do you th think there could be people for whom after five or six years, the only thing they would want would be medical assistance in dying, despite all of your good care. Um, the first point uh, is, um, no, I don't think MAID should be mentioned or offered to people um, when they are in acute care and even in rehabilitation after sustain sustaining a spinal cord injury. Um, do I think uh, people down the road, say, as you said, seven years or eight years, um, it, 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 is, uh, it is, again, a situation where it's important to look at all the variables, and um, it's a hypothetical situation, and I can't say it would be, a pos would, be, would be a good thing or not. I can say that I have not witnessed that. Uh, what I have witnessed is that after people turn the corner, uh, and rebuild their dreams and rebuild their lives, that uh, suicide is not something that they turn back on, other than if there are multiple compounding um, uh, problems that they face, such as in, in the social supports area, housing is a major theme, affordable, accessible housing, and living in poverty are crushers. They crush people's souls. Um, and I think it's also important to say, uh, sir, that I don't speak for everyone with a spinal cord injury. And each person is an individual uh, who uh, ultimately has a, a right to, to decide if there, in fact, is informed choice and a real choice. Thank you very much, Mr. Terrio. Thank you. Uh, and next we have Mr. McGregor. You have the floor for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Co-Chair. Um, Ms. Hewitt, I think I'd like to, uh, to start my questioning with you. Um, if you look at the, uh, the mandate of our committee, it's actually quite broad. I mean, we were appointed um, to review the provisions of the criminal code relating uh, to medical assistance in dying and their application. 
But we're also uh, including uh, things like mature minors, advance requests, mental illness, illness, the state of palliative care in Canada, but also the protection of Canadians with disabilities. And, and when, when you think of that last part, you know, like, this is part of our committee's mandate, the protection of Canadians with disabilities. Like, what comes to mind for you uh, with regard to that instruction to this committee from the House of Commons? Thank you for your question. For me, th that part of your mandate is 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 why I, I asked to be a witness to this committee. I strongly believe that as a nation, we're not protecting disabled people at the moment. So, uh, you know, I, I strongly believe that you cannot advance with expansion of MAID until we've dealt with some of those issues. For example, 7% of the people living in our long-term care facilities are younger disabled people who have no other option but to live there. I can tell you that they don't want to be there. And of course, the person I talked about, Sean, who uh, passed away through MAID before C7, he did not want to be there either. And he chose MAID over living in long-term care. That tells me that we are not protecting these people. Um, I, you know, this is a, a, a real concern to me as someone with MS and someone you know, that advocates for the MS Society as well as Disability Without Poverty, that we are just not providing these basic societal conditions that disabled people are able to have a choice about their futures. So, um, you know, in, an institutional life in somewhere that is designed for 85-year-olds with dementia when you're in your 30s or your 40s, and as Mr. Adair has talked about, often in this rehab phase where your situation is new to you you know it's it's crushing and on top of that you're going to be living in poverty and you're not you know in bc here in our long-term care homes the average amount of care a day is 3.28 hours that's not per person that's an average so if there is somebody in the facility who needs more time who is that person you know with severe dementia that that needs time you are not getting the, those 3.8 uh, 3.28 hours you are getting substantially less and and you know as people with ms with fatigue needs and and, and so on um it's I know many people who, for them, the fear of long-term care would seek them. They, they, they prefer to choose to be eligible for MAID, and it seems that that eligibility is happening at the moment. You made a great deal of separating uh, intolerable suffering from a medical condition versus a person's social conditions. Um, and and we, we don't want to speak in a broad brush for everyone. Everyone's different, and, and they're, it, it's a very subjective term. But, like, I guess for you, you know, like, thinking about the safeguards, like, at a bare minimum, like, what do you want to see, like, in terms of protection so that the social conditions are not influencing a person? And, and really, they are, they are looked after, but they still feel that their medical condition, despite all the supports they may have, is still leading them to a life of intolerable intoler suffering. Like, what's the bare minimum we, we need to be aiming for as a country here? Right. I, you know, so... Um, thank you again for, the, for that question. So um, Madeline, who I talked about, is, is a friend of mine, and I know that you're in BC and Madeline is in BC. She has treatment options that have worked for her, and those have now been removed because she can't afford to pay for them. If there is a track record of treatment that works, the removal of that treatment cannot therefore lead to MAID. So, you know, I believe that where the person is able to state what they need to have that intolerable suffering removed, I believe that those should be in place before they become eligible for MAID. And if we cannot do that as a country, then we must return to that original sense of made of being towards the end of life for terminal conditions. And we have to fix those conditions for disabled people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'll now hand this over to the co-chair for the round of questions for senators. Thank you, Senator. Uh, on va aller au Senate.
we will go to senators now because one of the senators have has left the three remaining senators will have a bit more time we'll begin with senator meiji you have the floor thank you mr co-chair thank you to the witnesses for your information my first question will be for dr coelho i would have i would like you to be concise when i practiced i had a patient who had multiple sclerosis who was really suffering that just had a little bit of mobility in his fingers to be able to bring his fingers to his mouth and he said that if one day my heart stops don't do anything let me die and then that happened his heart stopped we brought him back to life and he said to me good thing i was brought back to life i can think clearly i don't want to die so do you have patience like that and bringing that patient 20 years to 2022 this type of patient would this type of patient ask for medical assistance in dying so could you be concise because i have a question for ms hewitt i will try my best and thank you for the question uh, through mr chair i would say that i also did home care i didn't have time in my thing to, i did home care for people with severe mental health addictions dementia and disabilities in montreal before i relocated to london and many, many times um, I've accompanied people through suffering, uh, medical suffering and psychosocial suffering, and they were able to overcome and be super happy to be alive. And most of it required time. The CLSC system in Montreal was amazing when I was there. We had PSWs and a whole care team, and we were able to abate those death wishes. Merci. Thank you. My question for Ms. Hewitt and probably Mr. Adair, if he would like to add something. I know you're aware that there was a letter co-signed by 43 senators in January 2022 to call on the federal government to promote the bill on the Can Canadian Disability Benefit. Do you think that if there was that guaranteed basic income for people who have a disability, would that be enough to prevent them from asking for MAID, in your opinion? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I think there's many things about the Canada Disability Benefit that are still unknown. Eligibility, the amount. Um, there, are, there are things that relate to um, how much it actually costs to where the poverty line would sit if, if you are um, somebody who is disabled and um, research from other countries would say that it's 40% more than the, re the disability line for those who don't have disabilities. The poverty line is the poverty line. And, you know, a common phrase that uh, I know Mr. Dare has, has heard me use is that, you know, it's not lollipops and rainbows. It's still the poverty line. It's a start of where we need to get people to. Um, you know, the other, when it comes to, you know, as, as Mr. Adair spoke to housing, when it comes to treatment, we need people to be able to function so that they can deal with their disability rather than dealing with the double whammy of their disability and abject poverty. Um, so it's, it's a start, but do I think that the Canada Disability Benefit alone will stop disabled people accessing MAID? My personal opinion is no, that it's one of a package of measures that we need to do as a country. Merci, Senatrice. Thank you, Senator. We'll have to go now to Senator Kutcher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I have three sh short questions for Dr. Colejo and then one slightly longer one for uh, Michelle Hewitt. Uh, Dr. Colejo, is there, uh, we have heard that uh, made, many made providers are family physicians. Uh, we're wondering, is there a consensus amongst family physicians that all family physicians should inform patients about MAID, even if their conscience precludes it. I'm so sorry, Senator Kutcher. I don't know what you're talking about. 
So if a family physician feels that in their conscience they shouldn't tell a patient about MAID, do all family physicians think that every family physician must at all times tell patients about MAID being available? I, I, I honestly, I'm so sorry, I'm struggling. I, I don't know that there's any consensus on this issue. Uh, I'm saying that Susan McDonald and other people at the committee said that it should be part of informed consent. And I'm saying that's a very dangerous principle to apply when we know that there's discrimination in healthcare like the BC report in plain sight demonstrates. Thanks. I appreciate that. that's what I was asking, whether there was consensus on that. The, the second question, again, is uh, for, for fam our family physicians, uh, do they have consensus about MAID being provided to track one patient as they currently are, are identified? Is there consensus amongst family physicians that they should be provided? Again, uh, through um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kutcher, I don't actually know. I'm not an academic family physician. I'm a family physician who works really in the margins. Um, I do work with, I do connect with other family doctors who work in marginalized communities. We are all concerned about this, but I have no idea and I can't comment on the consensus of family doctors. Okay, so you wouldn't know whether there's consensus among family doctors or not consensus about any aspect of made provision? I really wouldn't, so I can't answer the question. I'm sorry. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate you you're trying. Uh, to, to, to Michelle Hewitt, um, I think that everyone in this committee would agree that poverty and, and any other social or economic factors should not be the driver for made provision. The expert committee report noted that persons with a disability who request MAID should be offered housing and income assistance and other needed supports. W would you agree uh, that such safeguards should, should be uh, provided to, to any person with disability who, who requests MAID? I would say that housing, not to live in poverty, access to treatment, should be provided to all disabled people, whether they are approaching MAID or, or not. I, I believe that, um, you know, disabled lives are worth living, that we contribute to our society in so many ways. And at the moment, there, there is a lot of suffering in the disability community that isn't caused by the, by our disabilities or impairments. First, I, I, com I completely agree with you on that. The question is, this is, a, our discussion is about MAID, however. So, right. so, so, so the question is, is, if a person is disabled and doesn't have adequate housing and doesn't have adequate social supports, should, as part of that MAID assessment, those be offered to the person? That's Absolutely. the question. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and how, uh, urgent, how urgent would that be, in your opinion? I, I would say that they are extremely urgent and that a person who, um, who has got to the position of applying for MAID is already in crisis and would need a lot of support to put those complex pieces in place. And I would hope that that's what we would be offering that would some, there would be a position, a person, a body that would examine the, those, those complex pieces that went into those decision. And as I've said, you know, I use the example of my friend Madeline, she knows exactly what she needs to not access made. She needs the treatment options that she can't afford and work for her successfully. Right, and so if someone says, look, this is helpful to me and I need it to be helpful to me, this should be considered and every effort should be made to provide that to them. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator. Uh, we'll now go to Senator Delfon for four minutes. Senator Delfon, four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Will be for Mrs. Zowit. Uh, you, you saw the uh, task force report and I'm sure you read it as I did. Uh, the, the, the members of the, uh, of the group have expressed consensus on the way the evaluation shall be made, and they have stressed the importance of social economic factors in the th thinking process of the requester. So am I to understand from what you say this is not enough, and if this is not enough what they are proposing to make sure the assessment rests on the proper informed consent, 
and not a, a short reaction to social socioeconomic difficulties. Uh, so what kind of other guidelines would you suggest we add to prevent people from uh, requesting, or at least not requesting, but receiving MAID? Because there's a distinction before requesting it and getting the assessors to agree that you, you're entitled to it. I'm, I'm sorry, was that addressed to me? I think it was. Yes, yes, sorry, I yes, wasn't clear, sorry. sorry. My, my apologies, it was a sorry, switch Mrs. over Witt. on technology. Sorry. I, I think, um, as, as, I, as I just mentioned, the, the role there has to be not just to um, examine that those conditions are, are um, leading to someone to follow through with MAID, but the solutions have to be put in place. That's the, that's the piece that is missing, um, that somebody who, um, that the assessor sees that, um, you know, that there are these, that there are these extraordinary needs that are causing this suffering. If it was a, you know, um, we take great lengths in this country to take care of all kinds of people in all kinds of ways. And we had an incredible response when we started a pandemic, right? And, and, and we found vaccines and we rolled them out and those sorts of things. We rose to the challenge. We are not rising to that challenge when it comes to these people who are in such crisis that they are um, they are not only ex asking to access made, but they are following through and dying. And I, I can only refer you back to my friend Madeline and her desperate need for treatment. And that, for example, one of the safeguards is that there's a 90 day period. So if somebody is in crisis, there might be time will help maybe to solve the crisis. And also that the assessors must discuss, try to understand the real reason why the person is asking to have access to MAID and to try to redirect that person to proper social assistance if available. So my, my question would be back to you all. What if that pro proper ass proper assistance is not available, but it is still necessary to relieve that suffering? I, I, I strongly urge you to say that, you know, that, that we're better than this. We can find these solutions for these people and that, that accessing made for, you know, the, for non-medical reasons, for suffering that can be alleviated by other conditions is simply unacceptable. So those assessors, um, you know, um, in those safeguards in that 90 days, what what are they going to do? Who's going to take that responsibility? And are you, as parliamentarians, going to stand up and say, yes, we will fund those things that desperately need to happen, because that's what we need? Thank you. Merci, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Martin, for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. And I just want to thank the witnesses for your very compelling testimonies. Um, and Mr. Adair, just my father suffered from spinal cord injury, and uh, he showed us his incredible strength through the suffering that he endured. Uh, thank you for your important work. Uh, my question is for Dr. Coelho. I'm wondering if you could um, comment on the the scope of the of made that's being looked at by our committee just any comments you have as a family physician and, and the experience you bring thank you uh through mr chair um i've watched every hour of the amad committee thus far and um up till today committee meters meeting uh, members have disputed the truthfulness of stories that have been shared by witnesses who've come forward and said that made professionals are beyond question. And consistently, there's been over talk, topping, talking on top of experts who have been warning about caution and, and even questioning their integrity. As well, some physicians on the committee have really failed to provide expected medical expertise surrounding clinical epidemiology or correct guidance on how to approach this as a medical procedure. The cases of concern that we've all mentioned signal that the made regime safeguards do not work to protect Canadians. These stories contradict those uh, statements by Abby Hoffman and committee that there are simply no problems with the MAID regime. 
um, and actually point to inadequate data collection when you can't make good decisions if you don't have data. Committee members asking loaded questions with only one word answers have tried to paint concerned witnesses as wanting Canadians to suffer through years of useless treatment. But actually the reality is that patients are waiting years for treatment and this wears people down. Consider, Alan Weep testified that if someone wanted MAID because it took five years to access the service, she would consider that irremediable. Patients with unaddressed psychosocial suffering will be therefore given MAID by assessors like her. And Audrey Bayliss said she'd rather die than living in a nursing home. That is actually a statement about the uh, uh, atrocious state of our underfunded long-term care centers. Um, also, I keep hearing a recurring legal argument that withholding made from certain groups is discriminatory, but this is not how medicine works. In medicine, we have strict medical standard of care safeguards, as well as required eligibility to meet a criteria for a treatment. Persons with mental illness with or without disability, which is often exacerbated by psychosocial suffering, have a disease process that can predispose, predispose them to suicidality with no proof that their suffering is irremediable. We just don't have the evidence. Thomas Insel, former head of the NIMH, wrote a book called Healing, in which he confirms the unknown prognosis of mental health disorders, but outlines how prognosis does depend on community life, supports, and productivity. Purpose. In light of this, the government providing death as an option while simultaneously failing its duty to provide timely care, supports, enriching community life, livable income is actually quite shameful. Mr. Luc Thériault reassured us that if the expert panel and special joint committee arrive at the conclusion that mental illness should be excluded, it, we should be reassured it would be. But we know that the expert panel didn't even weigh on that important question. But the Quebec Commission has decided that made for mental illness should be excluded. Mr. Chair, I thank you for inviting me. The work of this committee is so important. And I ask you for an honest re re review because your MAID regime is in a very dangerous. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Senator Martin. Uh, this concludes our first panel. I want to, on behalf of all of the committee members, uh, thank uh, Dr. Coelho, uh, Ms. Michelle Hewitt, and